Black Myth Wukong might be the biggest game in the history of gaming. I'm serious. Let's run the clips. Today we're talking about Black Myth Wukong. This is a big action combat adventure from uh, Game Science. This is a mobile developer uh, jumping into their first big console PC game. I actually didn't know anything about Sun Wukong before seeing the game. I had a little bit of research. I went into it knowing just a little bit, but I feel like the game is like really prompted me to just explore the Chinese mythology because I would I had no idea beforehand. Boom, there you go. A ton of people asked us to make this video. You guys know we're not the biggest gamers, so I had to look into this. And I'm telling you, this is huge news in the gaming world. It's huge in the Chinese world. And of course, it's like just accumulating so many streams and plays and users that it's actually becoming mainstream news in more of a CNN, Newsweek, etc. that type of style. So listen, guys, I'm gonna just pop up some photos right here. Listen, let me just tell you this right off the bat. This game is based off Journey to the West, the ancient Chinese tale from like 800 to 600 years ago. And I'm telling you just straight up from a gaming visual perspective, it looks incredible. It does not surprise me why it is number one on Steam. By the way, on Steam, it has a 10 out of 10 rating. You guys let me know what that means. It's not my world, but I know that it means something. And I'll tell you this, there are incorpor incorporating a lot of traditional Chinese settings as well as uh, traditional Chinese mythology and mysticism into it. I mean, just look at some of the characters and the villains or the enemies or the rivals you will face. The Red Lung, the Kan Jing Lung, Lung is dragon. You know, you got an Elder Jin Qi, Cyan Long, Guang Zhi, uh, you know, I don't even know. A lot of this stuff I'm not familiar with. I only have a passing understanding of it. Like I said, it's sort of a mix. It's not actually about the Monkey King himself. It's about this guy that's the chosen one. You could think of it as the Monkey King's like grandson whose uh, goal it is to gather these like six different pieces of the Monkey King to release the Monkey King to save the monkeys against the gods. Anyway, guys, like I said, it's based off Journey to the West. It's getting compared to Elden Ring. It's getting compared to God of War. I'm not really a, you know, Souls-like gamer. I didn't even know what that genre of gaming was, to be honest. And by the way, if you're wondering why I'm doing this video by myself, it's because Anders in Paris makes sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, check out Smile Lifestyles at SmileLifestyles.com. For me, it reminds me a little bit of like Zelda. And Zelda is interesting because Zelda is made by a Japanese developer, Nintendo, right? But it's more set in European mythology with the elves and more of like, almost like a whimsical Games of Thrones type of vibes to it. I played uh, Ocarina of Time on N64. And interestingly enough, sword, staff, you know what I'm saying? There is some comparison, uh, but obviously most of the Souls-like games have been based in the European Anglosphere or the some sort of Western European, more Game of Thrones, more, you know what I mean? Something with Zeus, so that, like we said, God of War, just Western mythology. This is from the Sinosphere, not the Anglosphere, or even uh, Plato, Socrates, not that. We're talking about Confucianism, uh, Confucius, and Taoism, Buddhism world, okay? So, by the way, guys, it just broke the record for streams. A lot of them were driven from China. However, this is the biggest chinese theme game in the Western world history. So let's just say there's it's been streamed 3 million times. Let's just say 2.5 are in China, half a million are in the West. So it's still pretty significant. And I, I this is what I would compare it to. Like I said, guys, I'm not gonna get into the game mechanics of it and game development because that's just not my world. But it reminds me of how Chinese uh, foldable phones are being super competitive right now, even though uh, not all of them get exported to the West. But, you know, like the Xiaomi phones, the Vivo phones, OnePlus, Honor Magic V3, and a lot of people game on those foldable phones. So there's a sort of a loose connection right there. I'll tell you this. When I was doing my research for this video, it made me want to get a PS5 just so I could get Black Myth Wukong. Because when I was growing up, I would read the Xu Hong Sun Wukong Monkey King Chinese mythology with my parents. That was my first exposure to learning any type of language, reading and writing Chinese. You know, obviously I didn't pick up too much from that, but that's that was like in my brain since I was like five years old. So when I heard that there was a dope game sort of bringing this journey to the West mythology to life and it's and it's dope and it's action, and it's violent, all you know what I mean? All the things you like a guy likes from a game it had those elements. So it was really cool to see them make it like universally platable, uh, uni universally platable. And like just prior to this, my coverage had been on 
this Chinese gaming executive who wanted to do this same thing as as Black Myth Wukong, who got poisoned and killed. So I wasn't too optimistic. So it's it's cool to see. So anyway, here are my five reasons why Black Myth Wukong is important. Number one, introducing Journey to the West to the rest of the world. This is an important piece of Chinese mythology. It survived the Cultural Revolution because, but you know, at different points in history, different aspects of it have been highlighted during the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was a re rebellion thing. So they like were using the rebellious side of Wukong, but maybe nowadays they would downplay the rebellious side. You know, it's so interesting how p different people play with it. But uh, I think the Chinese people have been good at creating things always. They create a lot of culture, obviously, most of the culture in the Sinosphere, not all of it, but like a lot of it is Chinese created. However, other people have always been better at taking it and innovating it and picking it in a new direction, whether you're talking about Japanese taking ramen and making it their own, or even Dragon Ball Z being explicitly based off Journey to the West, but obviously Goku and the manga and the anime aspects have so much more universal level platability to a westernized audience or just more of a modern audience, I think China's always like kept it so esoteric and old and true to form and like grandmother culture style. So it's like, I always saw that like Chinese culture was like the root of a lot of things. And I'm not saying that means everything by the way, guys, but other people would take things and, and make it their own and like make it more modern. But China was sort of stuck in the past. So for them to actually have Black Myth Wukong and keep it so true to the core stories, but also make it fun to play with and to make people actually interested in the mythology. I think that is really special because that is in some ways like introducing your own people to your own culture in a cool way, but also outside people too, right? Like we said, out of 3 million people, let's say 2.5 are in China, point uh, five, 500,000 are outside. Point number two, showing traditional or ancient Chinese culture outside of a context of geopolitics. Obviously right now, you know, there's a lot of really varying opinions, a lot of really mixed bag opinions on like whatever modern China is or modern Chinese iteration of the government or how it projects power. However, everybody can look at this game and be like, this is dope. Like Vietnamese people, they know the story of Sun Wukong and the Monkey King and like uh, Indian people, they have this uh, Hanuman, which is like, uh, a, like a parallel type of story. Obviously they know the story in Japan. They know the story in Korea. They know the story all around Asia. So I think it's just cool that it can be free from anything related to what is modern day, you know, uh, iterations of civilization that often take, the, you know, the nation state and the government, it all gets conflated together. This is like clearly a part of ancient civilization because the story was written like 800 years ago, first told. It was officially printed in terms of like a more formalized text 600 years ago, 1592. And look at this, look at these real world inspirations. I'm just going to pop them up right now. Um, these are all real sites, like primarily in Shanxi, China, which is like right next to Shandong. And these are like all the sites, not all of them are in Shanxi, but a lot of them are. And it's just like, it's cool to see because listen, guys, if China's going to be the 1B superpower for the next, let's just say like 30 years, right? And in, if we go by like some certain specific economic metrics, like PPP, purchasing power parity, it's going to be the number one, 1A. It'd be good if we at least had some tertiary understanding of China rather than just these, uh, Ovid memes or like child labor memes or all these like negative memes. And I'm not saying there's like nothing to those things, but it's like, we got to have a more holistic, like nuanced approach. It can't just be what we're told. Cause like I uh, hear, this is what people know right now. They know these emojis, right? They know they're, they're very Mulan, you know, whatever-esque or turning red. Then you've got modern day buns, like Waitan, like the hyper-modern skyline, maybe Chongqing, Shenzhen, drones or whatever like that. But then what about like the Song Dynasty? The Song Dynasty is uh, one of the better regarded dynasties in Chinese history. And it's like, that's when the Sun Wukong mythology was even developed, you know, and then exp subsequently exported to Sinospheric countries from that point. And it's just like, I get it, dude. America is easy to understand. It's a dope empire. It's 250 years old. Um, you know, obviously you could argue that the Anglo sphere empire, if whether you count Netherlands and obviously England is part of it, but it's like, it's longer than that. But it's like, it basically 250 years is really short. China's history, debatably 3000 to 5,000 years old. And it's like, if they're going to share 1A and 1B superpower status, it would be good if they understood more about each other. Obviously, right now, China understands a lot more about America than America understands about China. Maybe Sun Wukong, as trivial as mythology is, you know, just like Mulan is also mythology. It's like, it could just be 
uh, entryway to more mutual understanding and mutual understanding hopefully can lead to more cooperation because certain barriers and certain triggers won't get triggered off as much. I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't want to say like I'm over speaking on the importance of a game like this, but the more research I did into it, I was like, no, gaming is soft power. Gaming has become so dominant. It's going to have an Olympics. It's recognized as an esport by Nike. So it's like, Gaming is real soft power in the same way Hollywood or sports, just like Yer, uh, Yao Ming, Jeremy Lin. It's not just like this sort of like geekdom world off to the auxiliary side of like not really impacting mainstream pop culture. Like I think people used to perceive it that way in the past. Nowadays, there's probably more gamers that playing games than there are any other sport. Let's be honest. There's more people playing FIFA than maybe people playing soccer, at least in first world countries. I don't know. Yeah, third world countries, it might be different because obviously the access is different uh, to you know high-speed internet streaming, things like that, desktops. Uh, point number three, it shows that Asian developers um, as well as Asian IP can do well. So for the longest time, Japan's IP, whether it's Ninja, Samurai, Bushido, uh, obviously the modern day mangas, I mean, I don't even want to say JAV, whatever, whatever, hentai, all this stuff is popular. Everything's popular out of Japan, right? Uh, some of it's imagined, some of it's based off reality. And I'm saying that it's cool to see China get in there because China is the biggest gaming market in the entire world. Just like it's the biggest phone market in the entire world. It's the biggest sneaker market in the entire world. It's the biggest market for the NBA in the entire world as well. Or it will basically overtake if you extrapolate the trends over the next like 10 years. So it's like, why shouldn't it have some homegrown entrance into the game? You know, I mean, it's just logical. Korea had PUBG as well, but they more focus on MMORPGs. And it's like, I just feel like a lot of Chinese stuff, uh, Genshin Impact was dope. But it's, like, it's not for me, but I'm just saying it was good. But it was like, uh, that was a lot of mobile stuff. This is the first AAA game, meaning that it's like fully fleshed out uh, for console, PS5. I think it's coming to Xbox later, but obviously it's on uh, PC. And it's just like, I just think that this is going to lead to almost like, imagine like a, a, a God of War game, but like with Genghis Khan or like, even if it was like Warcraft or more like uh, Age of Civilizations or something like that. I think that that would be really sick. And just like, we're exploring a whole new cultural sphere that hasn't been explored before because obviously for most of the past 150 years, which is globalized modern history, the West has been hyper dominant. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but it's like now it's time to lean into like other spheres of content that have like a lot of deep depth into it. Obviously the next one up, if China's gonna lead the consumer market for like most things on earth, not all things on earth, but most things on earth, they should be catered to a little bit, right? I mean, I know companies want them to just consume, 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 but they're going to start to want to be catered to as well, right? Like when I play a game like Elden Rings, I'm not going to relate to it, you know, because it's like uh, where we come from is not where these like medieval knights and Game of Thrones things took place. Anyway, point number four, it beats the criticism that Asian characters don't sell and don't count as diversity. So I think for a long time, the more capitalistic people in, in media as well as games were like, oh, well, you know, Asian guys, they don't really sell, especially Asian male characters. And then number two, there were like, uh, there was a bunch of reviews that came out. I think most namely the one from Screen Rant that said, um, you know, I don't really feel like there's a shameless, there, I feel like there's a shameless lack of diversity and it's attracting the wrong type of fans. And then a lot of other people were like, just because this is a game from China based off Chinese things that were written 600 years ago and it's trying to be hyper accurate, there's no female characters. Why does there need to be? Like, you know what I mean? Because I think a lot of people, it's interesting because when I was reading the comments, I know like a lot of people, they're not really, they tr they're they trying not to like products coming out of China right now, right? Whether they're explicitly influenced by the government, like an Olympics program or completely not, at least obviously influenced like this black myth Wukong, they're trying not to like it, but they're like, dude, at least it's like, there's no microtransactions. There's no like things that are ideologies that are being shoved in my face. It's just trying to give me a good game beaten. I'm the good guy beating up bad guys. So I think that that's really interesting. That's been an interesting shift in the West as I guess, you know, as you could see across the Western world, a lot of people are not really happy with the way the Western world is being run or the policies or whatever like that. And I think it's just acknowledging that uh, most action or violent games, I looked up the statistics, they're about 75 to 80% male, 20% female players. And I don't think there's anything wrong with like catering to that. Like, I don't think that, it, yeah, that would make sense. The guys like, like first person shooters and like fighting games and like building empires and like conquering things. I don't know. It seems super logical to me. And then of course, I think that this is going to change because obviously the Assassin's Creed set in Japan, it didn't have a... Japanese male protagonist. I heard the next Assassin's Creed is set in China. They're not going to make, they're going to make it like a, 
a morphable protagonist, which doesn't even make any sense because obviously that still plays into the first part where they're saying that like Asian males are like not viable, sellable products in a modern world or whatever. I think it's changing, but I think that obviously companies are trying to hedge because ultimately they're about money. And point number five, it's just cool to see art tra transcend politics. Like I was uh, seeing some channels that are hypercritical of China, the modern China, the Chinese government, but they were still like, I give this game a seven. I give it an eight. I give it a nine. This is like the best game I played all year. You know what I mean? Like some people give it a 10 out of 10 and at a baseline, it's been getting like a seven out of 10. So um, like I said, I don't know if I'm going to go out and get a PS5 just to play uh, Black Myth Wukong, but I think it's like a cool thing that's bigger than I thought because even my parents messaged me and at, were asking me about this, like, oh, you know about Wukong? And they even knew the story, how it's not really Sun Wukong himself, but really more of like his grandson trying to like regather his body and his attributes to like rebuild him and release him from the stone. So I was like, yo, this is a cultural moment that I think all... Chinese Americans or, you know, I mean, you could say, I mean, it depends if all Asian American gamers at least could take a look at, because I think it's a bigger deal than I thought. And I think the gaming world is, is more meaningful than I initially anticipated. So, I mean, it's a really cool piece of news. Like I said, man, it just makes sense. Like if people are going to be the biggest consumer market for a product and they have the capacity to not just consume, but also produce in that field and in that sector in that industry, they should go do that. But obviously they have to make sure that the product is platable, enjoyably, uh, universally accessible, and just like, not just dope for the domestic crowd, for the international crowd. So let me know what you guys think. My biggest takeaway was like, man, I think a Genghis Khan game is next. Until next time, guys, let me know what you think in the comments section below. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Check out Smile Less Sauce on Amazon. SmileLessSauce.com. I'm out. Peace.